Welcome to Jackson Lewis's podcast, We Get Work. Focused solely on workplace issues, it is our job to help employers develop proactive strategies, strong policies, and business-oriented solutions to cultivate an engaged, stable, and inclusive workforce. Our podcast identifies issues that influence and impact the workplace and its continuing evolution and helps answer the question on every employer's mind. How will my business be impacted? The United States Supreme Court's recent decision to end the Chevron Doctrine in the Loper-Bright case exposed a governmental fault line, which may have far-reaching implications for many entrenched U.S. federal agency regulations that have existed for decades, and consequently, for employers. The Loper-Bright decision could make it difficult for Congress to pass specific and forward-thinking data privacy and security laws to close the current gap in the regulatory landscape. In this episode of our podcast series, Workplace Law After Loper, we discuss how employers can remain aware of current and often conflicting requirements and ongoing challenges for compliance. Today's hosts are Melissa Pasqualini and Rob Yang associates, respectively, in the Long Island and San Francisco offices of Jackson Lewis and members of the Privacy, Data, and Cybersecurity Group. Melissa and Rob, the question on everyone's mind today is, how does the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Loper Bright affect employers' need to comply with a patchwork of data privacy and security laws? And how does that impact my business? Thanks, Alicia. Hello, everyone. My name is Melissa Pascalini. I'm an associate in the Long Island office of Jackson Lewis. As part of my practice involvement in the firm's data privacy and security group, I advise on various privacy and cybersecurity related issues. Here with me today is my colleague, Rob Yang. How are you, Rob? I'm doing pretty good, Melissa. Hi, everyone. Like Melissa, I'm an attorney at the firm's San Francisco office. As part of my practice, I also focus on issues relating to data security and privacy. However, I have a more of a litigation bent to it, so I also deal with a lot of like SIPA litigation, data breach litigation, and things of that nature. Great. So, Rob, we're here today to talk about the Supreme Court decision, the recent Loper Bright decision, which effectively ended the Chevron deference. And we're really here to talk about how that impacts the world of data privacy and security, including regulation and enforcement of related issues. Yeah. So, before we dive into any details, let's kind of like talk through some context first. Chevron deference is a legal doctrine that came out of the Chevron USA versus Natural Resources case back in 1984. And since then, the doctrine has been used to allow courts to defer to a federal agency's interpretation of ambiguous statutes that the agencies are responsible for administrating, but so long as the interpretation is deemed reasonable. So for decades, The Chevron deference has been given to agencies like the FTC, the FDA, and all other federal agencies, giving them a great latitude interpreting laws related to what they do. But, you know, what would happen if this principle is weakened or eliminated? What happens to AI governance when the agencies are no longer given this wide latitude to interpret these kind of laws that Congress promulgates? And that's what we're really going to talk about today is the recent Supreme Court case that came out this year, Lopers Bright Enterprises versus Raimundo, which basically overturned the principle of Chevron deference and shifted more of the regulatory decision makings to the courts. So now with this kind of crazy wild, wild west, like, what do you think is going to happen, Melissa? I think that's a great point. There's such a glaring lack of regulation when it comes to data privacy and security related matters. There's no one organization that really spearheads either the creation or the interpretation or the management of these regulations. So now, you know, due to this change, Congress is really tasked with a pretty difficult task at hand, which is to pass laws and, and regulations that are extremely specific and have, you know, incredible foresight and accuracy, which could really result in the regulation of data privacy and security matters being either exceptionally slow or even underdeveloped generally. So with this reverted deference, interpretation of legislation now relies on the review of the trier of fact to make a final determination. So as a result of that, the data privacy and security related regulation is going to suffer from, you know, I think quite a few things, right? We're going to have a lack of understanding, you know, in evolving technologies, especially when it comes to things like AI, general knowledge around, you know, AI tools and things of that nature. There's going to be a lack of a controlling federal agency. There's certainly now a shift on the burden on Congress to enact extremely specific legislation, like I mentioned. 
I would imagine, and this is definitely more in your realm, Arap, but I would imagine there's going to be a flood of litigation that's going to come out of this. And there's definitely, I, I think, in, in my opinion, definitely going to be a shift towards regulation by the states. Just taking a step back and, and really thinking about AI generally, right? Because I think that that's a big one when it comes to, you know, the impacts that this decision is going to have just on the data privacy and security realm generally. And it's not just me who thinks that, right? Several justices brought up the topic of AI during oral arguments. Justin Kagan, she even included reference in her dissenting opinion about it. So there's certainly concerns about the long-term workability and having Congress generally decide very highly technical statutory questions, right? Especially when it comes to things like AI. So let's talk about that for a minute, right? What are you really seeing, Rob, when it comes to AI, the different types of tools that are being used and how it's being used in the workplace? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, broadly, AI as a field is basically computers trying to mimic human intelligence. And from a workforce perspective, I'm seeing a lot of clients using or want to use AI to kind of, you know, see, understand and respond to natural language. They analyze data, like for us in the wage and hour class action group, it's very important for some way to efficiently analyze all of that kind of data from payroll, timekeeping, et cetera. And clients would really like to use that kind of data to make recommendations and to make decisions. And right now we're seeing more of an emphasis on employers using traditional AI to process and interpret data. But now with the onset of like generative AI, like ChatGDP, it's now come to the point where AI is being used to generate new content. And to be sure, you know, employers are using AI to perform tasks trad- traditionally imp- performed by humans, uh, especially in the HR space. Like recently, I'm sure everyone's been hearing more and more about how AI is being used in making hiring decisions and identifying internal talent and predicting attrition. You know, however, a lot of employers should be mindful of the pitfalls that come with that kind of power. Like, for example, you might inadvertently just have some kind of bias programmed into your AI in which you're screening out applicants under a protected class. And, you know, with those kinds of issues going out there, the lack of understanding on not just the employer's part, but the court's part, it's going to lead to a lot of, you know, gray areas that... You know, it's good for us as attorneys, but it's bad for everyone else who needs to spend the money to try to get a AI governance model in place. Yeah, Rob, I couldn't agree more. I think that there's definitely potential that AI regulation is going to suffer from this lack of understanding by just various key decision makers generally. You know, now the onus is on the courts, it's on Congress, it's on judges and lawmakers to specialize in the interpretation and even creation of, of new laws. And even the most technical savvy lawmaker doesn't really understand what AI is, right? For various reasons. It's, it's you know, the biggest one is, is mostly due to its ever-changing nature, but it's such a highly technical area. It's a very technical field. The lawmakers and judges have to rely on information generally provided by specialists in the field to be able to understand the complexities that, you know, would result. But even with such reliance, you know, we still need somebody to distill this information. We need someone to be able to bring this down to a level, you know, where lawmakers and judges can really understand it. And there's going to be levels to that, right? Because as with any other subject matter, there's a degree into which, you know, in which individuals understand things. And the complexity of how AI tools work is definitely, in my opinion, I think unlikely to translate very clearly. I think there's going to be a lot of a lot of questions um, in terms of having you know individuals themselves, whether it's the judges or the lawmakers, having to decipher what these tools can do and and how to regulate them. But also, what about the fact that the attempts to better understand AI from a legislative or even an enforcement perspective, it's not something that's new. There have been agencies and lawmakers that have already attempted to clarify misunderstandings, and they've been unable to even come up with one definition of what constitutes AI, right? Like, what is artificial intelligence? Because it varies, and it's super complicated. It's very complex. There's a lot of technicalities to it, right? So I think because of that vast complexity, it's going to be very unlikely that lawmakers are going to jump to create new legislation. And I think that that's definitely something that is going to is going to halt legislation in terms of, you know, data privacy realm and AI just generally. Yeah, for sure. I just want to just contrast to what you just said. Um, You know, in Europe, they have the AI Act and the GDPR, and there's already a very clear set of rules as to what is AI and how it's being used. And they're they, they in the European Union are moving forward with developing AI in a more predictable regulatory environment. 
On the flip side, here in the United States, a lot of the regulation that we have is actually being based on existing laws and guidelines. There's no real federal agency that's taking charge of AI regulations. And even if there are, you know, we got this whole problem of being in a post Chevron deference world. This is probably going to lead to something like what we have in California, where I practice. Uh, we are seeing a lot of like metapixel claims being brought under the California Invasion of Privacy Act, which was passed back in 1967. This was well before the data of the internet and was meant for phone calls. And you, can you imagine how hard it is trying to adapt a law from 1967 in 2024 when you're applying technologies that didn't exist at the time? So, yeah. What, do you, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think that we've, you know, we've seen that in, in a lot of what we do. We see a lot of... No, I wouldn't call them stale laws, but they're things that were developed at a time where nobody could even conceptualize what was going to happen in five years, let alone, you know, 20 plus years to come. And so I think that in that instance, I think oftentimes we've relied on agencies, right? We've relied on individuals that are a lot closer to this, individuals that have experience, you know, working in that field to be able to regulate. So now the thought of, you know, not having that is it's definitely something that many individuals, many business owners should really think about. Yeah. So to follow up on your point, you know, here in California, we have, we have a pretty good example of what would happen in a regulatory landscape where things are very unclear. You know, we have the CCPA here in California, but that's not, you know, universal one size fit all, even within California. The CCPA, for example, won't go back and try to interpret how the CIPA, what I was talking about earlier, it's not going to really dovetail into that. And you're just going to have this Frankenstein patchwork of laws, even within the same state, trying to figure out how this is going to tie back to AI. Yeah. So lawmakers are definitely going to now be tasked with having to use incredible foresight and wisdom in terms of creating regulation. We can no longer rely on these federal agencies to help provide guidance and, and technical knowledge. The burden has now shifted. We used to be able to place the reliance on these technical savvy agencies. And now, you know, the burden's shifting to lawmakers in Congress, which, you know, arguably are not as technical or savvy when it comes to the world of, of data privacy and security. And before, generally, lawmakers could create a vague law that really allowed for specific interpretation from agencies that were much more closer and familiar with these subject areas. We don't have that anymore. Now we have lawmakers that are forced to create laws, much more specificity. So the real issue here is it doesn't matter how much foresight a lawmaker really holds. You know, unfortunately, they likely won't maintain or they won't even be able to get to establish the technical expertise that a lot of these agencies hold. You know, this gap in knowledge is certainly, I think, in my opinion, further accentuated due to the constant developments and new technical innovations that are created in the data privacy and security realm. These lawmakers are having a difficult time trying to create proper legislation that properly regulates all these different areas, these newly developing areas, without either, you know, misapplying definitions of certain things, like, you know, bringing us back to the inability to create one actual definition of AI to be used across the board, or even the intentions behind it. Um, it's definitely going to be particularly difficult. And I, I can see this really play out in two ways. Either the data privacy and the security regulation is going to be overstated and inhibiting. It could cause an overregulation in the field, which I think would end up leading to an inhibition in terms of technological innovation. And it might ultimately end up with halting US AI growth to a stop. If there's no clarity in terms of how you know to regulate this, or if there's an overregulation, it can definitely stunt any advances that we make. But on the inverse, right, the fear of overregulating, lawyers could create too little, the lawmakers could create too little regulation. And underregulation could be just as damaging. It could potentially lead to extreme violations of privacy for individuals or in realms of AI where we didn't even conceptualize that these, you know, violations could have come up. And inevitably, this is going to lead to a flood of litigation when there's going to be legislation that governs AI. Um, obviously, Congress isn't going to be able to address every nuance and they're going to want to rely on agencies to interpret those kinds of laws. But without that, we're going to just see challenges in court. Judges, they don't 
have all the technical knowledge that these agencies do. They don't have all the staff with the proper training. And it's going to lead to a whole bunch of reasonable people differing in opinion about what the reasonable interpretation of these laws are. You know, without a real clear picture of how we're supposed to deal with these things, you know, we got lawyers with one interpretation, judges with another interpretation, industry experts with another interpretation. You know, like, what do you think is going to really happen in this, you know, post Chevron world? I think that there's definitely going to be a shift towards regulation by the states. So we've seen it happen with data, with consumer data privacy laws across the country. Due to the federal government's inability to create one comprehensive data privacy law, it's resulted in, I think, at least by my last count, 18 separate state-specific ones, right? And that number just seems to continue to increase. Week by week, we see a new jurisdiction that's passing through litigation, a new comprehensive consumer data privacy law. And from a business operations standpoint, a potential increase in regulation in states is certainly can be overwhelmingly challenging to keep up with, especially think for businesses that are operating nationally. You're no longer required to keep up with one law. You now have to think about and intertwine 18 at, at my last count, like I said, all these different jurisdictions with different state specific requirements, all due to the fact that, you know, the federal government, is, as much as it seems that it's tried to do, has failed to really create a comprehensive data consumer data privacy law. And so if that's any indication of where we're going now, and, and, and at that point, there were a lot of federal agencies that were able to regulate and things like that to provide at least a little bit of a background for Congress or for any individuals that were involved in any data privacy or AI related lawmaking. And now we're not going to have that. So wh- where do we go from here? I think that one thing in terms of you know business owners and just business operations generally, I think many businesses might find this Loper Bright decision as something somewhat relieving. It's relieving them of any compliance or enforcement risks from federal agencies. But I think one thing to think about is that we're not really out of the woods here as a business owner. Yes, we we might not be as regulated from the federal agencies on these issues, but that could definitely lead us to the potential of having additional challenges from either state legislatures or either, you know, state specific enforcement agencies or authorities. What do you think about that, Rob? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, you practice in New York, I'm here in California, so, you know, coast to coast there's going to be vast crazy differences in how things are being interpreted and and even enforced. So now with this, you know, post Chevron deference world, we have a lot of risks, a lot of opportunities for AI governance. Well, on the one hand, we've been talking about how this is going to create legal uncertainty and, and potential litigation. It could also spur Congress to act and bring some much needed clarity to AI laws. Maybe they'll finally you know, get their things together. Maybe they'll create another agency which will be dedicated strictly to AI and tie in with all the other regulators out there. But I think ultimately it'll be up to a combination of policymakers, courts, and of course the AI community to navigate this transition. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. All right, Melissa. So now that was fun chatting with you about AI and how we're going to try to figure things out together. Um, for everyone else out there, if you enjoyed the discussion, you know, don't forget to subscribe to our podcast, share this episode with your coworkers and friends, and hopefully we'll see you back soon to listen to more insights about what we have on the future of AI law. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, and to our listeners, just want to add, you know, please feel free to reach out to us or to any other jail attorney with whom you regularly work if you need any other, any other assistance. Thanks. Thank you for joining us on We Get Work. Please tune in to our next program where we will continue to tell you not only what's legal, but what is effective. We Get Work is available to stream and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Libsyn, SoundCloud, Spotify, and YouTube. For more information on today's topic, our presenters, and other Jackson Lewis resources, visit jacksonlewis.com. As a reminder, this material is provided for informational purposes only. It is not intended to constitute legal advice, nor does it create a client-lawyer relationship between Jackson Lewis and any recipient.